that the lecture is being recorded a couple of ways. Once Ms. Uh, Minister Mohammed's uh, lecture is complete, and if you do have questions, all that I ask is that you stand up, that you speak clearly so every recording device can capture it. Got it? Okay. Well, again, uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, Minister Mohammed. He is the Buffalo representative of the Honorable Elijah Mohammed. Please welcome Minister Mohammed. Thank you all for your warm, warm uh, welcome and applause. In the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness uh, in the oneness of Allah, God, the oneness of the prophets of God, the oneness of the prophetic community. I bear witness to the oneness of divine revelation. That is to say that the same God who raised up Moses is the same God who raised up Abraham, is the same God who raised up Jesus, and also is the same God who raised up Muhammad and all of the prophets, peace be upon them all. And we thank Allah for his divine revelation, his divine guidance to the human family, the entire human family. Divine guidance, divine revelation is always revealed by Allah through the mouth of his prophets and servants. Uh, divine revelation never comes from a, a ray of light or from a cloud or from a wisp of smoke. But divine revelation always comes uh, from the mouth of the prophets that Allah raises up for the people's guidance and example. And so we thank Allah for all of those former messengers, prophets, warners, wise men and women. We thank Allah for Moses and all of the Israelite prophets and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank Allah for Jesus and the disciples and the apostles and for the New Testament. We thank Allah for Muhammad and the Holy Quran. Peace be upon all of the worthy servants and messengers of Allah, God. As a student and follower of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, under his direct guidance and leadership, we are forever grateful and we can never thank Allah enough for his divine intervention in our affairs here in the wilderness of North America in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, uh, W.D. Farad, uh, his coming from the east to the west, his raising up his messenger, his Messiah, his exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and for now, today, giving us an extension of one who exemplifies and personifies uh, the honorable Elijah Muhammad is an extension of grace and mercy and also a divine warner to America and to the nations of the earth and to our people. And so that man is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Uh, it's always customary that we always greet you with the greeting words of peace and paradise. I salam alaikum, shalom, or peace be upon you. Those words simply mean peace be unto you. I think I want to thank you all for the warm introduction and the warm welcome and receiving the Nation of Islam on the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford. Uh, it's a great honor to be on the campus. It's a great honor to be invited by Dr. Gaskew to speak to the class uh, Islam and Social Justice. What I want to do right from the very beginning is just to lay a backdrop, a foundation for what we want to say and uh, to be able to answer a few questions at the end. But I want to begin by saying that, um, as I mentioned, divine revelation is never revealed in a vacuum. Divine revelation from God, guidance from God, always comes to address specific contemporary issues or certain impasses that the people are faced with in the day that they're living in. So divine revelation comes based on universal principles, eternal truths, but it's, it speaks to a contemporary temporal issue or hurdle or roadblock that the human family 
are faced with at that moment in time. And so divine revelation comes and there's always a condition that that revelation is to address, to bring the people beyond that impasse closer and closer, step by step into oneness and understanding with Almighty God a lot. And so, you know, there's been revelation that has been given. And revelation is always given in parts. It's always given in piecemeal. It's always given in stages and degrees. And so the Torah or the Old Testament revealed through Moses to the children of Israel was given to address the condition of bondage, servitude, uh, that the children of Israel, the Jews, were faced with in Egypt. And so there was always two aspects to that guidance, that divine revelation. One is a guidance to bring a people out of weakness into strength, out of bondage into freedom, out of ignorance into knowledge. Divine revelation always comes to take a people from the bottom and raise them to the top. Divine revelation comes to make the tail the head and make the bottom rung of the ladder, the top rung. And so whenever you see any people receive divine revelation, that people, based on that divine revelation, based on following the guidance of it, you see that group of people go from the bottom to the top in every discipline, every field known to man because of their following and submission to divine guidance. Divine revelation from God gives people insight into human nature, gives people insight into history, gives people insight into nature and universal truths that are all around us, but maybe we weren't aware of the universal truth until revelation came as a key to unlock the universal truths that are all around us even at this very moment. And so that divine revelation leads the people from an abject condition into a very exalted and uh, a very high and esteemed position in every discipline, every field. And so you see the recipients of the Old Testament and guidance from Moses in the form of the Torah became masters of law and jurisprudence, became masters of medicine became masters of mathematics, architecture, engineering. Divine revelation comes and gives people insights that causes that society or people to advance further than they were before. And if the people who are the recipients of divine revelation take it and follow it, then you see their condition rise and elevate, and then that people become the magnet or become the... Uh, clarion call or the beacon light in the midst of the darkness of the people where the whole human family begins to gravitate to that people because of the guidance that they have received. And so the Torah or the Old Testament found a people in an abject condition and raised them to the top in every field. We see that the revelation of the Holy Quran to through Prophet Muhammad of Arabia 1400 years ago, peace be upon him, the Arabs were in a state of what is called Jahaliya, which means intense darkness. They were very superstitious, very backwards, uh, very divided into tribes and little families and all of the tribes and families warring against one another. They had a practice where they would bury their little daughters, if the firstborn child was a female, they wanted a firstborn child to be a male. So if the firstborn child is a female, they would bury the little baby alive. And so that practice, that superstition and all of the drunkenness and all of the uh, division and uncivilized behavior, that is a, a state of intense darkness called Jahaliya. But as we saw Revelation coming to the desert Arabs 1,400 years ago, we saw them come out of that condition. We saw Revelation speaking to the heinous practice of burying girls alive. 
We saw Revelation speak to the alcoholism and the drunkenness and all of the uncivilized behavior. And we saw the Arabs introduce to the world the Arabic numeral system, going from a Roman numeral system to the Arab Arabic numeral system, where you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 through 9. That is an Arabic numeral system that the world uses today, which allows for complex mathematical formulas. Algebra is an Arabic word. And the, uh, the mathematical formulas and computations were made possible by an Arabic numeral system. And so we saw knowledge and science and map making and cartology and all kinds of light coming to the people. So divine revelation is described in symbolic terms as light. It's, it's in the Bible described as light. The Holy Quran describes it and compares divine revelation to lightning, flashes of lightning and claps of thunder and describes divine revelation as a periodic flash of light where you see lightning and you hear thunder and then it describes it in the Quran in Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 that whenever the lightning flashes, the people can see how far they off are off from the path. And then they can walk back to the straight path. But when it's dark, they stand still because they have no light to walk in. And so the book of Isaiah says the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And the people who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, the light has shined upon them. And so whenever the people are in darkness, they stand still. They are faced with an impasse, a hurdle, a stumbling block. And the society can't move beyond that because the scholars don't have the answers to the problems that the people suffer from. Wow. The scholars are, have a limited understanding of what field they claim a certain knowledge of. And the scholars themselves disagree with each other and they always update and upgrade and downgrade and revise and edit whatever theory, whatever uh, understanding was put forth yesterday. Now today in the new journal is upgraded, changed or revised. And so the scholars have an imperfect knowledge of whatever field they claim. And so sometimes we have a a uh, circumstance or a condition where if we read a few books that are on the syllabus. Yes, sir. If we have read a few books and we just read enough to complete the assignment that Professor Gaskew gave to us, or if we get cliff notes mm. or go to the index, or if we buy a research paper from somebody who may be selling one, then we, we feel like we have mastered the subject matter yeah. that has, has been put in front of us. So this class is called Islam and Social Justice, but we have to, as students, you know, I'm glad to be on a college campus where um, objectivity and critical thinking skills are developed, where you as a student Learn to be a critical listener, a critical thinker, so you don't have to rely on somebody to tell you what you sh how you should see something, how you should understand the issues, because there's always somebody who wants to try to water down the truth, to reinterpret the truth, and give you a a uh, mixed up, fixed up reinterpretation of the truth. And so on a college campus, I'm so glad to be on a college campus and you all are here because you won't rely on Fox News Come on. to tell you and give you the lens that you should look at world events through the lens of Fox News or MSNBC News or CNN or any of these corporate-owned uh, news outlets 
owned by a small group of corporate, a smaller and smaller group of corporate interests. And if you, uh, if they give you any truth that will affect their bottom line and their profit margin, they will never give you the 100% raw, uncut, unadulterated, unmixed, untampered with truth. They will always put a spin on it and try to tell you how you should understand world events. And so it's good that you're at a research college. Yes, sir. Because you're learning to have objective uh, skills and reasoning and all kinds of um, critical thinking skills because the man of God, the Messiah, the, the messenger of God has never been well received by the powers that be any time a messenger was ever raised up. And so the, the, the pharaohs and the herods and the Nebuchadnezzars of the world, the rulers of the world who expect the coming of a deliverer, they will always try to throw shade on any messenger of God. They will always try to uh, you know, discredit, malign, vilify anyone who comes among the people to raise the people because the corporate interests of this world, they profit and they benefit from the ignorance of the people. Is everybody okay? Yes, sir. We're not going to be very long. We just want to lay a foundation for the coming of Master Farad Muhammad, W.D. Farad, the founding of the Nation of Islam, why it had to come in the form that it came in, because divine revelation always speaks to the present condition, but using timeless, universal, immutable principles and truth. And so the powers that be, if the truth be told, every messenger of God was charged with false charges, convicted of those false charges, thrown in prison. So it's almost as if you can't even really be a messenger of God and not have done some jail time somewhere. Mm. We're not advocate, advocating doing jail time, but Jesus went to jail. Moses had a warrant out for his arrest. Daniel was put in a lion's den. That's jail. Oh. The three Hebrew boys put in a fiery furnace. That is prison. That's death row. So not oh. only did they were they sent to prison, they were convicted and put on death row and executed in many cases. And so, you know, as it was in those days, so it is now. And so when you meet the man of God or see the man of God, there's always an attempt to portray him. Or to try to vilify him. To, to try to portray him as a villain, a terrorist, a troublemaker, uh, as somebody who is blasphemous, somebody who is a traitor, somebody who is seditious, somebody who is anti whatever the government is, from page one in the Bible all the way to the end. And so you have to use critical thinking skills, especially when it comes to the time that we're living in right now and talking about Islam and social justice. And so, you know, this man of God, we're saying that divine revelation comes through a man of God, and he comes to speak to the condition of the people. And uh, the people begin to move forward based upon a new guidance, a new revelation. They move forward. And so that analogy of a, a thunderclap and a flash of lightning. Lightning warns you about an, a coming storm. Lightning can also be destructive, destroying property and people at the same time. And so when the warner comes, it's not because everything is all right. It's really because everything is all wrong. During the time of Egypt or Rome or Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever of the former nations that have passed before. And so when you look at the Bible and Quran and you look at how lightning comes and sheds light on the people, divine revelation, 
And you see how lightning also gives a charge. <clears throat> it charges up the atmosphere. The air is charged. There's a stirring that takes place. There's an electricity that's in the air and the people begin to be activated based upon a knowledge, a new knowledge going into their heart and their mind and it stirs the people up and activates the people and they begin to be activated and moving in a direction to try to overcome the, the stumbling block that was placed in their path. And so they begin to address the social issues of burying a female child alive or of all of these divisions among the people, divine revelation activates the people. So Islam or divine revelation has always been at the core of social activism, social action and social change. And so it's no different with the nation of Islam and the coming of Master Farad Muhammad who came to, from the east to the west. As it says in the book of Matthew, mm -hmm. as the lightning shineth cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the eagles are gathered, yes, there sir. shall the carcass be also. Yes, sir. Anybody read the Bible at all by a show of hands? Is anybody familiar at all with the Bible? The Bible, the book of Matthew talks about the Son of Man. He's the son of a man. <clears throat> so the man of God is a human being. The messenger of God is a human being going to other human beings. He's called the son of man because he's born from a man, but he has great power, great wisdom, great knowledge, and he comes like a light. His presence, his person is like a light. He brings illumination. So as the light comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. We were taught that Master Farad Muhammad came out of the east, came to the west, to America. He found a carcass, the carcass meaning the remains of something that was once alive, but is now dead. You usually use the word carcass when you talk about another beast feeding on or attacking and devouring another life form. And so you don't, a carcass is something that's left after it has been fed upon and attacked by another beast. But in reality, the carcass is a people who were once alive, but are now dead mentally, spiritually, morally, economically dead to the knowledge of themselves, dead to the knowledge of where they came from, dead to the knowledge of what their name is, dead to the knowledge of any syllable of their mother tongue. They don't know their own language. They don't have their own names. They call themselves by somebody else's name, but the name that they call themselves by was stamped on them like you stamp a brand onto a cattle or a horse or an ox or a sheep to show ownership of that animal. They would usually brand into the hide or the flesh of the animal to let everybody know who this horse belongs to. And so to wear the name, black people wearing the names of our former slave masters and their children. Even though your name is not Johnson and Jones and O'Reilly and O'Toole and O'Fool and McGillicuddy mm. and Underwood and Over the Snow, to grandmother's house we go. Your name is <laughs> not that, but you and I call ourselves that because we have no knowledge of what our name is. What is our original name? Everybody else on the planet, you see them wearing their own names. If you, are, if you saw an Asian man walk in here today... And you asked him, what is your name? And if he said, my name is Leroy Jackson, you would have <laughs> pause. You would take a pause. And you would say, your name ain't no Leroy. How is how you would want some kind of explanation. Right. How is it that your name came to be Leroy Jackson? You look Asian. I am Asian. My name is Leroy Jackson. And the next question will be, well, what happened? 
where you adopted, what happened that interfered with your cultural reality where you wear another name other than your traditional name? You would know that something happened. But if you saw a black man walk in or a brother walk in and you asked him, what is your name? And if the man said, my name is Deng Xiao Ping Li Ching Wao, you would say, mm. what? wait, no, nah, stop. Why? why are you clowning me now? You're <laughs> clowning me. Your name is not Deng Xiao Ping. Go ahead. And then the next question would be, well, what happened? Were you adopted? What happened to change your reality? But if I walk in or you and I walk in and we say my name is Tyrone Green or my name is uh, Tyrone Jackson, nobody takes pause to say what happened because it's accepted. It is a conditioned circumstance. It is the norm. And it really tells you that you and I have been desensitized to the impact that has happened to our rea reality as black people. And so we never even asked that question. But our condition is a condition which the Bible and Quran describe as mental death. And so the only one who is in the business of resurrection, not physical resurrection, but mental, spiritual, moral awakening and resurrection, God is in charge of that. And so our condition did not deserve or warrant the coming of a scholar, the coming of a teacher, the coming of a social worker, or the coming of somebody else who has a good heart. But yes, the, con the condition deserved or called for the coming of God himself, coming from the east to the west in fulfillment of all of the prophecies that have gone before. Yes, so right. the Jews expect the coming of the Messiah. The Christians expect the coming of the Messiah or the Son of Man. The Muslims expect the coming of the Mahdi and the Messiah will be with him. So all of the faiths, I don't care what it is, you can go to South America, the Central Americans expect the return of Quetzalcoatl, the Christ figure in yes, the Central American religions. All of the religions expect the coming of a great one the great Messiah or the great Mahdi or the, the Son of Man or the second coming of Christ, they're all expecting somebody to come. And the Bible says, if they tell you he's here, there, or over here, don't believe it because he's coming from the east, coming into the west, and he finds a dead people coming to a place where the eagles are gathered. Eagles, yes. And the eagle is the symbol of America, yes. which is one of the highest flying birds in the bird kingdom which is a bird of prey, which has talons and sharp claws, which likes to fly overhead and uh, rain down shock and awe on people who can't defend themselves, yes, who don't really pose any threat to America, because these people have already been convinced to turn over any type of resistance, to, to tell us where it is, let us catalog and document where your radar and all of your anti-aircraft, and once you have agreed to turn it over or shut it down or drop all of your defenses, America finds a way to justify mm. going there and raining down shot and all, and this is going on all over the planet Earth, and so it, an eagle is a bird of prey. And he said, wherever the eagles are gathered, there shall the carcass be. And so Master Farah Muhammad found a carcass, a dead people, in America. He went to a place called Black Bottom, Detroit. You can't get no lower than a place called Black Bottom, Detroit, where, similar to the intense darkness of the Jahaliya of the Arabs prior to the advent of Muhammad, black people in Black Bottom and all over America and throughout the earth, he found a people who did not know their name, their culture, their religion, or their God. And since divine revelation always comes to address specific problems using universal immutable principles, Master Farad Muhammad brought divine revelation in a way that was like a thunderclap, where it is when you hear thunder, some people put their fingers in their ears. Some people go and run and hide under in the closet. Or some people become fearful of that because 
it is it's not a pleasant sign. It's, it's something that will wake you up out of a slumber. And so some people stick their fingers in their ears to try to ignore it. But the thunder is a warning of an approaching storm. And so he came in a way like that and had a teaching and a methodology that was not liked, not understood. In fact, about it, it was purposely misrepresented and purposely uh, made to be misunderstood. And it was opposed and worked against. And it was uh, shown to the people as something that you should fear or reject or run away from. Who understood that the Messiah could be one of four men. He said either it is Malcolm X, it is Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, or Elijah Muhammad. He said one of these four men. And then he began to cross the list off. He said, well, my, uh, Malcolm X is uh, dead, so he's the martyr of the movement. Elijah Muhammad is just too old. Stokely Carmichael could, could do it. He has the necessary charisma. Martin Luther King is a real threat in this way if he abandons his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrine. This is in a Freedom of Information Act memo from 1968 of January. So as they cross the list off, Martin Luther King is dead uh, three months later in April. Um, the rest are Elijah Muhammad, Martin Luther King, and Stokely Carmichael. They believe Elijah Muhammad is too old. He's going to die soon. But they have Stokely Carmichael and... Uh, Martin Luther King left. Now King is dead in 1968. And so if you believe that Elijah Muhammad could be the Messiah, and you wrote about it in your own documents, but you believe he's too old, he's not the Messiah because of his age or his physical condition. He's the Messiah because of the revelation and the truth that is in his heart, in his mind, in his mouth, that if he teaches a generation or teaches a student and puts himself into that student, then by extension, the one who represents him represents the Messiah, according to the words of the government of the United States of America, and they opposed him. And so they will always try to do that, and we want to just try to lay a base and answer some questions and talk about why Master Farah Muhammad came the way that he came and taught the way that he taught. There's no doubt about it that the condition of black people has changed. Uh, it's, a, it's diametrically different than what it was before the coming of Master Farah Muhammad. And you saw an elevation of our condition, not just in America, but throughout the earth. You saw the independence of uh, uh, African nations all around the globe, and you saw a stirring and a revolutionary movement and activism in black people in America and really throughout the earth. And so that is social activism. That is social justice. That is bringing about a condition where the, the uh, existence of black people now is more justified. Freedom, justice, and equality because now you saw dope fiends and uh, 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 alcoholics and all kind of people that were no account now standing up clean and dignified and well met and polite and uh, speaking with high wisdom and intellect whereas before they did not know who they were. So now you saw people who became morally upright, who began to open businesses, supermarkets, dry cleaners, restaurants, inventing certain food items a healthy living, clean living, marriage and family. And so if you see a person who was dead going to a living perpendicular on the square of truth, you can't say a social worker did that. You have to say that God did that. And the person that came to these people is God in person because he brought them from death into life. And so that message and that wake up message is to prepare black people and to raise black people and also to be a warner to the nations 
and you can't argue against results. You cannot argue that the nation of Islam produced Elijah Muhammad, produced W. Dean Muhammad, produced Muhammad Ali, produced Louis Farrakhan, produced all of these uh, people who are known around the world, and you know a, tr a, a tree by the fruit that it bears. So if you see Muhammad Ali known around the world, and you see him standing up against uh, being drafted into an unjust war, then what is the tree that produced that fruit? If you see a W. Dean Muhammad or a Louis Farrakhan or any of these ones who are known around the world, you have to see what is the tree that produced that fruit because no bad tree can bear good fruit and no bad tree, no a good tree can bear bad fruit. And so those men are good fruit from a good tree, which is the teaching and the coming of Master Farad Muhammad and the way that he taught, making decent, respectable, upright, morally resurrected black men and women and families. Yes, sir. No matter how controversial it may be. The truth is always controversial against the status quo and the powers and the governors that be. And so there is that controversial aspect to it, but that's why we're at University of Pittsburgh at Bradford today to be critical thinkers and objective and to deal with whatever controversial point or question that may be raised. And so I'm glad to be here as, a, as the Buffalo representative of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan and I want to just conclude uh, my remarks on that note uh, and open up the floor for whatever questions or comments that you may have. We have about 20, 25 minutes. And so I want to thank you for your patience and for indulging me and, and for hearing me. And I thank you and I greet you as I came before you. Assalamu alaikum or peace be unto you. Any questions or comments? Again, all I ask is that you stand up. Ask your question, please. Well, thank you, Islam. Uh, my name is Ali, but I came to ask you a question about the differences between the, between I'm Muslim and I'm not in the nation of Islam. What's the difference between your belief and mine exactly? Well, in the nation of Islam, we don't like to accentuate the differences and divisions. Um, we know that the, uh, the Holy Quran says that there will be differences, but that Allah will decide between that which we differ. And so uh, the difference, the main core difference is that we believe uh, that Allah, God, came to North America, to our people, in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. And we believe that he came in fulfillment of the appearance of of the great Mahdi, according to the Muslims, uh, and the Messiah would also be with him. So that becomes a core difference because um, Muslims don't believe that anybody would come after Muhammad. And they, uh, in the Quran, it says that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Uh, and so they're saying that the seal of the prophets means no prophet. No messenger, nobody else is coming. Um, but if Prophet Muhammad came 1,400 years ago, but all Muslims expect the Mahdi, all Muslims expect the Messiah, and every 100 years or so a reformer who was called Mujahid would show up among the people, then how can you say no one else would come when we're all looking for the coming of the Mahdi? And so people who receive divine revelation become very uh, exclusive uh, in their mindset where they feel like nobody else can receive divine revelation but us. Yes, sir. We are the final ones. And so at any time a, a man is raised up from God, the, the, the prior recipients will always say, well, he's not, he's not the one. He's not ours. He's yours. And they, will, they, they never accept a man of God while he's yet among them. He's always accepted after or to some degree accepted after he departs. But uh, that is the core difference. It's really not a difference, but it's something that religious people, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have argued about and debated about, but Allah will decide between what we differ. 
But everything else, brother, we follow and we believe in. Does that answer your question? Uh, minister, um, how did you first get involved in the uh, Nation of Islam, and uh, what led you to become a minister? Well, my, my wife, I was, I was in college, and, um, you know, I was in college and stuff, and thought I had knowledge, and I was, uh, you know, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, was, was going to the mosque, and she was telling me about, uh, you know, we would talk about the condition of our people, and she would say, yeah, that's right, you are right, because the minister says X, Y, and Z. And then we would talk a little bit more and say, yeah, I understand where you're coming from because the minister says, and, uh, and I said, the minister, who, who is the minister? And so she introduced me to the, the teachings of, of, of uh, the Nation of Islam and Minister Farrakhan. She brought me to the mosque, and I sat down, I heard it, and um, I just, it was clear to me right from, 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 from listening that first time, and so... That's how I got introduced, and I, uh, you know, my wife brought a tape home, a cassette tape. It was called, uh, To Make a New World, We Must First Make a New Woman. And he said, because when you teach a man, you teach an individual, but when you teach a woman, you teach a nation. Yes. And, he, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he quoted him, he said that a nation can rise no higher than its woman. And so um, she brought that tape home, and I listened to it. And from the first syllable of when he began to speak, everything made so much sense that I said, wow, I, I would like to do that one day. And so it was a long way off from that point in time, but I had a, a love for the word and a, a desire to, to want to share the word. And that's how I, I got interested in helping in the ministry in the mosque. And I gradually was brought along and grew up in the ministry. Thank you for your question. Is there any other question? Um, do you is it do you believe that white people are inferior? Well, I, like I said, you can't argue against results. You cannot argue against the superiority of what white people have built. Um, white people um, came out of Europe. Um, came out of uh, the dark ages and have built a world, have gone to the moon and sending uh, cameras and s telescopes to the moon. So you can't say a person is inferior who demonstrates that kind of result in the world. Um, white people are the clearest evidence, the clearest indication that the reality of God is that God is in men. God, the reality of God is in a human being because uh, uh, of the, the, the world that, that the Caucasian has built. And white people, in reality, are the rulers of this world. Um, so those kind of results can't be argued with. Um, as far as the, the, the word, the language, superior or inferior, um, in Islam, we believe that the that uh, the greatest among you and I is the one who's most mindful of his duty. And so, you know, superiority, inferiority is based upon demonstrating that in actual reality, actual facts, by performing your duty. And so if God told Adam to subdue the earth and made Adam his caliph in the earth, then the Caucasian has subdued the earth has subdued the oceans and the skies and space and the planets and have uh, been the uh, arbitrators and give justice where justice they, you know, deem it to go and withhold blessings and sanction countries and, you know, they, they exercise incredible power and dominion in the earth and there is no one on the earth that can oppose the dominance of white people except God himself. And so, you know, whenever you saw a powerful nation like Rome or these, you know, the, these nations, these former nations, you know, they were powerful in their day, and, but they all passed away. And so America is on that same road to, you know, pass away as ancient Rome, ancient Babylon, 
ancient Sodom and Gomorrah, America is on that road. But Allah, he never punishes any nation uh, until he warns them. He warns, he sends somebody, they warn, the warner is rejected, arrested, crucified, whatever. Treated how they want to treat them. And then what is what they warn about then comes upon them. And so we read about them, they're not here. So America uh, is on that road, but America, white people, Europeans, um, are not inferior in terms of what they have demonstrated of the world that they have built. Um, but I don't want to say, I, I say that to say also that, that, you know, America's been around a little over 200 years, and she's really on a decline and really on the way out. Uh, there's nations that have been around for thousand, you know, much longer than 200 years. So really it's a, it's a short lifespan. And what you see right now is you see America sputtering, hacking and coughing and in the really in the seizures and the throes of death. America is on the decline. You will be the last ones to know about as citizens. But if you check what Edward Snowden said, you check what, uh, you know, these WikiLeaks and these things, America standing in the world is, has been downgraded tremendously. And so um, that superiority is on a downward spiral right now. And the only thing that can save it is data connection lost. And to listen to a warning and guidance from one of the former slaves in the midst that would try to warn and correct America. But, you know, that, that's a good question. I thank you for asking that question, Brother Ali. I have another question. Yes, sir. Um, you were saying how uh, if an Asian person came in with a different name, it would bring up uh, controversy. But does that mean you do not believe in the mixing of races? No, that, that, means, that means that if a person looks, if a person is Asian they, and they come in and give you a European name, you're going to wonder how it happened. You know something happened. You just want to know what happened. And the only reason I raised that example was just an anecdote, brother, to, to say that nobody asks. Your name is Ali. Your name is one of God's names. Um, but nobody, what, nobody asked Maurice Jones, how'd you get that name? It's just a foregone conclusion. It, it has no shock value or no kind of, uh, you know, it, has, it does not make you ask, well, what happened? It's just accepted. So that was just to illustrate that. Um, I believe as far as marriage, I believe that uh, the, the black family, is in disrepair. Um, you know, the black family, whenever you have an accident that happens and they set up a triage or some type of way to address who, who's injured, priority is given to the one that has the most life-threatening condition. And so black people in America, the black family, and as far as uh, single-parent households, over 70% of black families headed by single parents. The wage gap increasingly growing. Uh, and so I believe that the first thing that has to be done is to strengthen black marriage, black family, as taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so, you know, that is where the priority should go. You can't dictate love or who somebody will love. But, you know, how can you love, as Jesus says, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself? So if you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? If love of your neighbor is predicated on self-love, then you really have to love yourself before you can properly love anybody else. If you hate yourself as you hate your neighbor, then that does nobody any good. Mm -hmm. And so I would respectfully say that in America, in the West, in a Eurocentric culture where you have, you know, chocolate cake is, is devil's food cake and White cake is angel food cake. Where you have people who, you know, will blackball you or blackmail you or, you know, everything of blackness or darkness is a negative thing. And so, you know, with that type of, you know, growing up with that, um, 
you don't have a we don't have a proper and healthy love for ourselves. So you see people bleaching black people bleaching them their skin. Um, you know you see people like Michael Jackson. He wouldn't you know he felt like he had to uh, appear a certain way. So you know he got some surgeries and things done. I don't know if Beyonce is, is doing that, but you know you're made to feel like you have to appear and look a certain way. You don't like your broad nose. You don't like your thick lips. You don't like your, you may not like your, your, your uh, woolly hair. And so, you know, black women, we spend a lot of time trying to, you know, undo what God made us. And so that's not a healthy love and respect for self. How can you love somebody else properly? I mean, you can love somebody and it's in a way... So, but we don't try to dictate who loves who, but we just first think we should have a healthy, proper respect and love for ourselves, uh, our people, build our neighborhoods up, build our businesses up, stop trying to force yourself into other neighborhoods and force people to, you know, please take my money, uh, please let us shop at your store. Um, I want to give you all my hard-earned money that I work hard to get it. You're trying to force somebody to serve you at their restaurant, you don't know if somebody serves you food begrudgingly because you forced them to with a picket sign. You don't know what kind of, okay, well, yeah, we'll serve you. Stay right there. I'm going to go in the kitchen and get what you asked for. <laughs> you don't know what's in the, why would you force somebody? So we say build your own restaurants, businesses, hotels, your own economic infrastructure, and people, you don't have to make people respect you by a picket sign, but People respect people that are productive. That's right. And so, you know, you can't argue against those results. So that's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. Thank you for your question, Brother Ali. Yes, ma'am. Minister, how did the September 11th terrorist attacks and the war on terrorism affect not only Islam in general, but the nation of Islam, in your opinion? In my, in my, uh, my opinion, and also my personal experience, it was like... Um, it produced a climate, an atmosphere um, at work, uh, in my daily travels and interactions of an intense scrutiny. Um, there was, there's always that scrutiny. If I go, I'm six foot two. If I go into a store, um, it's automatically, uh, I'm automatically suspected that I'm going to shoplift or steal, so they'll follow me around or keep an eye on me. Um, if I'm on, if I, you know, walk down a sidewalk, it's, it's like an apprehension or a fear. And so that was already there. Now after, of course, September 11th, it was intensified, an intensified scrutiny. Um, and uh, different kind of restrictions and limitations put on the Muslims. Um, it also... Uh, caused a lot of, it, it produced kind of like a chilling effect. Uh, people who were interested in Islam or the mosque, this environment made people kind of back away. Um, the very people that we want to go serve and try to enlighten, um, they had been, uh, seemed like they had more apprehension. So it produced uh, more scrutiny, apprehension, and fear. Um, in my personal experience, um, also, in my opinion, um, you know, it caused bank accounts to be, you know, all in the name of Homeland Security, bank accounts and money transactions to be uh, frozen and seized, uh, uh, Muslim charities all going down and people giving less or, you know, all kind of scrutiny over whose charity and funding is this going to Al-Qaeda, and so it was like, it's like how America puts sanctions on nations that uh, she does not like. It's almost like it's like a it's like a sanction as far as money and resources and support. And so um, that is something that's been felt personally. And um, you know, and so you know, it, there's that there's that lingering effect, ongoing effect produced from the uh, in the wake of September 11th, 911. You all, you all got a chance to read about it and um, 
um, in the books. Um, so you all had a, a discussion about it, somewhat, about September 11th? Okay. Okay, well, well thank you for your question. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Special thanks, because I want students to see, see you gave one of the most dynamic, interesting, compelling presentations. And you know what, folks? He didn't use PowerPoint, you see. <laughs> so, you know, you could do a fantastic presentation without the crutch of PowerPoint. Look at the person's gestures. Anyhow, you made a very important point, Minister, by saying, you know, a very important philosophical point. People look, they could look at the news through M N MSNBC's lenses or Fox's, but the point is that even when you read the Bible, and I try and study the Bible, ask for divine guidance, it's my interpretation, it's my view, and I could have, you know, four different uh, priests or ministers here, they'll come, each one may have a different interpretation of the Bible. Some will take certain things literally. Others will say, no, it's just a metaphor, it's just a parable. It should be taken symbolically. So what I respectfully ask is, how does one know that their particular interpretation about the meaning of some aspects of scripture is the true and correct one, since it still is being filtered through our own lenses and perceptions and, and past histories and personalities and things that we've gotten from the media and family. Yes, Thank sir. you very much again. Thank you for your question. Um, we, have, we have to be very careful with interpreting or giving our own interpretation to scripture um, because uh, the Holy Quran talks about that. It talks about rules of interpretation. Yes. And it says that, uh, you know, this book, the Quran, um, you know, some of its verses are decisive and others are allegorical. And those who have perversity in their hearts seek to follow that which is allegorical and give it their own interpretation. And none knows its true interpretation except Allah and those firmly rooted in knowledge. And they say it's all from Allah. And to allow, we shall return. So it gives rules of interpretation because there is a tendency, a desire, or a leaning to want to understand and interpret it. Uh, but nobody really knows the interpretation. And so as we read the scriptures of the Quran, as a Muslim, uh, before we even open the book, we uh, say a prayer, placing it on our foreheads, and we kiss it from cover, back, front cover, back cover, and we and we as we open it, we say, "I seek the protection of Allah from the accursed Satan." And so we have to seek protection from because Satan is he his his uh, his his modus of operation. Satan is to give false interpretation to Scripture, and so that is his calling card. So we have to say that prayer, and we still have to earnestly seek protection from trying to give our own interpretation which could be motivated by you know hidden agendas and desires and also shaped by our past experience and so we we want to we, we we seek protection from that it's not a hundred percent uh it's not a hundred percent airtight uh solution because we see that misinterpretation of scripture does go on and is responsible for division and religion today Unfortunately, we are out of time because the next class has an exam. Again, I would like to extend my tremendous thanks for Minister Muhammad for coming and, and being as a guest lecturer, and hopefully we can try to get him back here on a regular basis. Mr. Muhammad, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, understanding the, the unique circumstance of both. So um, that gave him balance and it, it, it informs his method of, of reaching black people as well as white people, uh, knowing both natures. And so you belonging to both, um, you know, that's something that is, is, is very prevalent in America. And so, you know, um, you, you being of both makes you belong to both. Uh, you may you may have a leaning uh, more a stronger leaning uh, to one or the other, but since you're from both and you you know you have, you're learning how to embrace both, uh, 
I hope. I hope you are, but it's, it's difficult because when you go among the two different um, the two different cultures, you feel you kind of feel like you don't fit in. You feel, but you you fit into you definitely fit into into white culture. You don't feel like that. Oh, I I do, but I guess sometimes I don't. Okay. It's it's weird to explain. Yes. I yes. just I feel that I know that I am different. Mm -hmm. um, and like with the Seneca Nation, like it's a matrilineal society, and it's my father's Native American and not my mother. Mm -hmm. So I'm technically, for some, I'm not considered Seneca, but I am first descended. So it could also be the con the social construction of it as well of, from Seneca and the Americans. Yeah. Well, you know, it's um, it is difficult, but it's it's like. A disadvantage can become an advantage. A, uh, you know that that need or that that uh, how you notice that you don't fit in, you feel that way, can become a powerful uh, benefit and plus, and and giving you a certain a certain amount of empathy and understanding for people who, who don't feel like they fit in, and you know a lot of young people and older people we don't feel like we fit in. Um, that's a, that is something that you know you have in, you know you you have intimate knowledge of, and it it, it can give you a greater amount of, of empathy. Um, and but it's just any 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 difficulty or trial or hardship like that has to be looked at and faced with with the proper attitude. Um, we all have disadvantages. We all have shortcomings. We all have we got we have built-in weaknesses, built-in shortcomings built-in deficiencies. And then the deficiency becomes, you know, when you, when you have your weakness, but you have your strength as a counterpoint to your weakness, it becomes like, a, it, it becomes something that can generate power, electricity within you, emotion within you because of the battle between the, the, the weakness or the defect and the strength that you have. So a, a lot, God gives us a defect. He gives us, we all have a defect. We got, mine is different than yours. Um, and then you find out that people that accomplish great things, when you read about a biography uh, or their life, you'll find out that they, they had to overcome some great deficiency or great defect. And you would be surprised. You know, and you, and you would say, wow, this great person, I never knew that they had, you know, like Einstein didn't speak until he was six years old. And, and so, you know, you read about these great people and they have, they all have some defect that they overcame. So we all have them, but the, the proper attitude is to, is to, uh, is to um, you know, recognize that the defect or weakness or deficiency, um, you know, it really is the doorway for you or you know, can be, uh, can be a, a point of great strength. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, yes. I, I don't want to be long with it. anyone else's questions. Okay. I don't want to be overly complicated or worried. No, no, it's, it's understandable. Like, I consider myself more cosmopolitan than American or Native American. Like, because mm -hmm. right. I also like to study about Peru, and mm -hmm. it's just, I see all people. It's yeah. hard to, I, I don't understand why not have you, you know? Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, someone else has a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Matt, do you mind if I ask a question real quick? Yeah. There's no doubt that the Nation of Islam has impacted uh, black America, yes, whether some black Americans want to acknowledge that or not. There's no doubt in probably the, the, the history and the, and the discourse of our nation. What's next for the Nation of Islam? Well, what's next is um, right now the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. Um, he, he uh, is our leader, teacher, and guide. So we take our, our cue and our direction from him. And what is next, um, according to everything that I understand and have been given, is uh, America is under divine judgment. Um, and we've been saying that from day one. And so uh, America is on the decline. The, the whole present world order is on the decline. Um, at the same time, the people in America, 
the nation of Islam, our people, people who uh, see some value in the teaching and guidance of Minister Farrakhan, have to work like never before to, um, to do what is described in the, in, the, in, in the book of Judges, where Samson saw uh, some bees making honey in the carcass of a lion. That's from the Bible. But uh, a dead lion, but busy bees making honey in, in the midst, in the carcass of that dead lion. Um, we have to work like never before to be productive and to build something, an economic uh, foundation of self-sufficiency. Um, where we won't be crushed by the weight of the fall of America. Um, black people uh, are on the bottom as far as everything we mentioned from different economic and other indicators. And if America falls, if the present world falls, we're on the bottom, we get crushed beneath it. And so we um, uh, have to work, and, and, and the minister has uh, an economic program, an economic blueprint which calls for uh, five cents a day, um, what is that, 35 cents a week. It's a dollar 40 a month, $18.20 a year, times 16 million wage earners, which is $291 million in one year. Um, because we have to, we have some land. Uh, the Nation of Islam, we do have some land. We need to get uh, that land producing and get more land to produce an economy um, to be able to withstand the fall of the present world. Um, the dollar is going to be worthless, uh, I don't know when, but very shortly. Yes, uh, supermarkets will be, uh, won't have food. Um, and so we have to work to try to put some type of economic independent infrastructure in place. Um, and so we, we're going to continue in that work, in that direction, in that mission, and continue to, to try to warn our people and mobilize and organize with our people. Uh, but if we, can, if we can weather this storm, on the other side of it is um, the kingdom of God, um, which is on earth. It's not in the sky. But the kingdom of God, America, really is... Uh, America is, is really like the foundation of the kingdom of God because you have every nation, every nationality, you have what heaven would look like here. You know, all of the immigrants and the, 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 you know, the patchwork of, of the people who are here. Um, but America will only reach that if she takes heed and follows divine warning and divine guidance to, to be made into that. And so that always comes from one of the former slaves, one of the despised and rejected people. Uh, it's always from one of the poor, abject ones that that warning comes from. It's never from the elite class of scholars that God gives a warning to. So then it sets up a trial and a, and a hardship. You have to accept guidance from one of these inferior, well, in their minds. In their minds, they feel like this person is inferior. How can he guide us and warn us? So it's always rejected. So I don't, I and mean, that's that's really general general overview. Um, but what's next is to continue in earnest uh, with the work and with the mission um, to raise the condition of our people. Thank you, Minister. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, um, I have a lot of burning questions. I don't really know which one to ask first. Um, I love God, and mm -hmm. everything I do is for God. Um, and I appreciate your passion for God and doing what you believe is like going out here speaking to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and the question I want to know um, is, like I noticed there's no other race um, here, like with your people accompanying you, um, and why isn't there any other race? And if, um, not just white people, but any other race, Asian, any other. Wow, yeah, that's, well specifically black and white. Um, black people, we have uh, some unique we have a unique circumstance. It's not the same as your circumstance. Our history in America and in the world. And so we have unique, uh, a unique condition that calls for a unique approach to address it. And it's like, um, 
It's like having a family. It's like if you have a family meeting at your house, your nuclear family, and um, you have some internal issues that you have to, you got to resolve these issues, and you got to do it in house. Somebody, while you're in the middle of that, somebody may come and knock at the door and say, "I, I heard you all outside. Um, can I come in? Can I help?" You, and you may say, "Well, with all due respect, um, right now these these issues are internal and, and family related." Um, we appreciate you wanting to help um, because the only reason you would not is because you want to help. So we appreciate that you want to help, but at, at the present time, we're going to have to do this in-house, and then we can invite you at some point once we reach a point where we you know, have some stability or whatever resolution. Uh, we, we may want to invite you back, but at present, your, your presence and your feedback and your input um, would not be helpful. It, it, it may be more disruptive. Um, you know, you, we may say some things in trying to resolve our issue that may offend you. We don't. We don't want to offend you, but we just can't sugarcoat it or try to uh, water it down because of your presence. Uh, that would, you know, that would water down our efforts. And so, we'd like to invite you back at another time once we can. You know, it's like a closed door meeting. Once we open the doors. And we'll allow you to come in. It's, it's similar.